Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I'm going to do a, a viewer request video, um, and I've done this in prior years as well, where basically I go back through and I take a look at some of the items that I reviewed during the course of 2019 and think back about the process, about the gear, about my the, 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 the whole sort of affair, and give some follow-up thoughts. This is a great thing for me, introspectively, to think about what all went on, but it's also a great way to, for me to kind of touch again on stuff that maybe flew a little bit under the radar, or talk about what changed later on in the year. So anyways, um, there you go. I I hope you find this interesting, and if you don't find it interesting, hey, guess what? Still free content. But, uh, yeah, let's go on ahead and forge on into the next uh, approach here. Okay, so first off, Hinder and I's full track. This is a knife that I ended up respecting a lot more than I wanted to keep around. It's sort of, I have this class of knives in my life that I desperately wish I had sort of enough use and enough space and frankly enough money to just keep around because I like this knife a lot. It's great. In every meaningful way, I enjoyed it and appreciated it, but when the time came, it just never ended up getting carried. So I've recommended it to a number of people. It's just it isn't one that stuck around. But I, every time I look back at it, I'm like, oh yeah, that was a hell of a knife, right? Um, you know, if only the toolbox was so much bigger, you know? But uh, absolutely a beautiful thing. You know, the Cricket Provoke is a weird knife, um, it, partly because I think it was a, a bellwether for the rest of CRKT's higher-end stuff, but partly because I think in practice it was probably the most high-end, or I'm sorry, the most sort of creative new knife of the year. Um, at some level, nothing else was that crazy. I am... I, I, there was so much coolness here in this particular piece that I, I just appreciated it deeply. Um, and so, although my review was in some ways a little bit cursory, because what the heck use do I have for a folding karumbit, um, this is another one of those knives that I respected amazing, you know, a, a great deal. And uh, although I have no use of one ever, oh man, was this good. And so I, I feel like at some level this didn't get the press it deserved. It didn't get the recognition it deserved, even though it was really good. Another good contender for the um, best and most unrecognized knife of the year would be the Spyderco Subvert. Looking back with 2020 vision, eh, um, it's very, very clear to me that the Subvert was actually probably the best high-end knife that Spyderco put out last year. The Drunken had its issues, we'll talk about it later. The Pison had its issues, we'll talk about it later. But in retrospect, the Subvert was just freaking good. Um, every part of that knife, the size perhaps aside, every part of that was just excellently done. And so I, I feel like in some ways that was, although it didn't feel that way at the time, that might have been the high-end Spydeco winner for the year, which is interesting. Um, absolutely not what I expected, but in retrospect, I find myself thinking, wow, I wish they made a smaller one of those because that was pretty damned excellent. Very impressed there. So the uh, Robinson, Brandon Robinson Bobcat here, was a, a, a knife that I think was very, very good, but it represents probably my favorite thing that happens on the channel, which is when I find a maker who is really underappreciated, or maybe under-recognized. Um, you know, Brandon Robinson w has been making this really cool stuff, but has also been a little bit, uh, well, under the radar, so to speak. And just like Rainy Day Knives, um, I, I was very, very impressed with the work, and so it always brings me some joy when able to, able to use the exposure that the channel can offer, to uh, bring some attention to somebody who's doing great work in relative obscurity. I'm sure it causes them some trouble from time to time, but at the same time, I don't know, to me that feels like a, a major win. You know, like, oh, sure, Spyderco made a good knife, no one's shocked, but this is maybe a bigger uh, and more interesting piece. One of the major trends for 2020, I felt like, was the fact that really, really good isn't good enough anymore. And the Ferrum Forge Mass Drop Dow is kind of a good example of this. This knife was substantially excellent. In fact, it was the best thing that they had made yet. But the thing is, it was almost lost in, in, in the fray among all of the other really excellent flipper frame locks that have come out. Um, and so it, it was a knife that I, I really liked. It was substantially excellent, but ended up just kind of getting washed off to the side. Like, I, the, I hadn't thought about it in like nine months after after the uh, original review, so it's quite, it's this weird thing where you, you like excellent isn't good enough anymore. You have to be excellent and memorable or excellent. I don't even know what you need to be. But it's kind of shocking to me, thinking back about it, how little I've thought about the Dow, knowing just how damn good it is. Like a couple of people have like put one in my hand ever since at like an event. It's like yeah, that's good. But it's very very strange. Uh, it, it's just a sign of how competitive the market is right now. I think.
the Cold Steel AD-15, I've talked about a couple of times at my end of the year roundup, but in some ways, I think this represents a, a, a beautiful thing for Cold Steel. Um, between that and the AD-10, this was them really just knocking out of the park some custom knives, and they didn't nerf them, they didn't screw them up in any way, shape, or form. I now own this knife. I actually repurchased this after I got a good deal on it, um, just because I like the AD-15 custom a lot, and this is just damn near is good. And so to me at least, this was a major thing from Cold Steel, and it was something that I was thrilled that they did so well. I, I was very, very happy with this knife, and I, I think, frankly, anybody should be, perhaps most of all, Cold Steel and Demco. They did really, really good work on this guy, and I think it, again, it didn't get the recognition it deserved. Remember we were just talking about really good isn't good enough anymore? Yeah, the Wii Knives Deacon is a really nice example of this. This is a knife that was substantially good, but it had a couple of little tiny flaws. I think the stock was a little thicker than it needed to be, and it's got that little, uh, you know, upturn at the back of the heel there that made it a little less than in my hands. But it was good, but it wasn't quite like, again, three years ago, oh my god, this would have been a world beater. But nowadays, the, the market is so intense that it, it couldn't stand up, so it's very weird, very good. But somehow that's not good enough, and that's, that's kind of amazing to me. But there were nice reminders that at the end of the day, design is really the big differentiator. And this is one of them. This is the uh, Laconico EZC uh, from uh, Monterey Bay Knives. Uh, this is a knife that is very, very simple. At the end of the day, it, it's basically built like a Kaiser, which makes sense because it was made by Kaiser, right? Um, but it, it had just a very, very thin and slicey blade. It had a really nice action. It had a very nice minimal size. I freaking love this knife. This is a knife that is a part of my collection, although it's been on loan for a while, actually. But I'm looking so much forward to, like, a, a version 2 of this guy. Um, if they can bring the integral construction of the XLC to it, oh my god, this is going to be good. But this is a testament that although fancy materials are amazing, um, it's not necessarily what you need right now. A really good, simple design can actually make a, a, up a lot more than, you know, freaking Timascus and carbon fiber and crazy material, you know... Uh, Seriously, at the end of the day, a good knife is a good knife, and it's not all about that race to the top in terms of materials or even any of that stuff. This was just substantially good. One of the biggest surprises of the year was actually this guy right here. This is the Pena Knives Front Flipper Trapper. Um, I don't say surprise because I expected Pena to do bad work, but, um, you know, I, I originally, you know, Enrique talked to me at one point in time and just said, hey, you know, I really like your work, I really like your reviews, and I like some of your perspectives. Would you take a look at this thing I'm making here? It's kind of crazy. I want to see what you think. Um, he sent it along, and, you know, the next freaking day, I was on the horn to him like, okay, where do I send you the freaking money? Because it was that good, and this has been... A a knife that has become sort of a cornerstone of my collection. It is my only handmade custom knife. It is completely and totally over the top. It's very expensive. You know, it's ridiculous at some level, but it's just so damn good that I'm very, very happy to have it around. And considering that later on in the year, this knife got its uh, production version made, uh, which I think actually is, in some ways, like material-wise, actually has some improvements, um, but it was entirely different. It's just, it's really, really neat. And it makes makes me just, it kind of, it's a nice reminder that although a lot of the stuff I do is very CNC focused, it's a, a lot of it's, you know, crazy computational milling and whatnot, this is just a guy sitting there in his shop and doing something amazing, and I, I, I really love that. And so the, the Pena Front Flipper Trapper is a unique piece in my collection, but it is absolutely an important one to me, and I, I really, it's one of the one pickups I'm very, very happy with this year. You know what? In a lot of ways, 2020, I'm sorry, 2019 was a very good year for CKF. Um, the CKF Sukhoi dominance, or whatever the heck they want to call it, this was great. This was a knife that was substantially overbuilt, not in the sense of like, built like a tank, stupid overbuilt, but in the sense of they went every extra mile they could find, and as a result, it was truly excellent. This is a knife that every time I see one, I think to myself, damn it, I should have just bought one. Um, then I remember it's just too big for me, and so it wouldn't work, but if they did this at like 3.25 inches, oh my god, would they have an amazing hit on their hands. Because this is just good. It's so much better than what most other people are putting in effort-wise, and it just makes a lot of other makers feel really, really lazy. They went an absolute extra mile, and I really did appreciate it. I think they come... Oh, man, was that knife excellent. And so it, it's one that's going to always feel a little bit like a one that got away, but I'm not sure it's one that I should go ahead and pick up again. A, because you can't freaking find them because they're limited edition. Screw you, CKF, but B, just because it's, uh, I don't know, it's just going to be too big. 
the Frank Clegg briefcase, I think, is a really interesting piece for me, because at some level it was one of the most beautiful objects I've owned. It was absolutely amazingly done. And at, at another level, I also miss it deeply. I ended up gifting this to Tony of Everyday Commentary because, uh, well, he started his own damn law firm, and a good lawyer needs a fancy briefcase more than a random jackass does. But the thing is, um, uh, this was really good, and it sort of set some of my expectations for what high-end leather work can look like, and I was very, very impressed by it. Um, however, at some level, there's always the element when it comes to your own personal collection of to thine own self be true. And I'm going to be honest, it's a little fancier than I am. At some level, that I, I got a little bit more of an Indiana Jones thing going on, and that's a little bit more Wall Street for me. So I, I really, really like that bag, and I'm really glad I got a chance to spend a lot of time with it. But I think ultimately it's, uh, it's found a better home for it, even though there's a part of me that looks at it just like, oh, that was good. By the way, these are going roughly in the order they came onto my table. There's no other, you know, don't interpret a deep meaning into these things. But anyways, Spydeco Drunken um, was a knife that had so much potential. Um, and in fact, there was so much good about it, but then it was sort of kneecapped by a bad clip, and it just didn't end up feeling like it fit into Spydeco's overall line. I think it's a, it is a substantially good knife, and I can see why some people love theirs. Um, and I can also see why some people hate it, too. It's sort of a really weird place in that middle there. And in fact, Spydeco had two major really weird place knives that showed up, the second one being the uh, Pison here. The Pison was a absolutely spectacular knife in some regards, but a big letdown in a couple of other ones. Unfortunately, they didn't quite have the detent right, and they didn't quite have the blade ground thin enough. I feel like this was a knife that was so close to greatness, and they put a really nice thin hollow grind on that and dialed that detent in a little bit better. This would have been an absolutely amazing piece, and I think it already was a pretty damn good one. But ultimately, even though I like it a lot, at the end of the day, I don't miss it in any particular way. It doesn't feel like the one that got away. I have my reground Nirvana, which I think covers its place in my collection. And I look at that mostly feeling like, oh, missed potential. And as a result, though, like I said, this ended up masking a bunch of other good stuff that came out from Spydeco. Because I think everybody was waiting for the Pison, the Pison, the Pison. That was sort of their Halo product for the year. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of people, myself included, it, it ended up falling a little bit flat. It was good, but it wasn't quite good enough to you know, meet that amount of hype there. And so the Subvert, which I really do think, like I said, was probably their high-end knife of the year, ended up getting almost no attention, and the Pison ended up getting a lot of press, and not necessarily in the way you want it to. You know, I've said a lot about the Nado uh, Typhoon Evo uh, already because it was Knife of the Year, and I think it deserves that. But uh, one thing that I do want to highlight, actually, was uh, if you listen to the Knife Knots podcast episode, I don't even freaking know, but the one that uh, was the year-end recap, I actually got Brian Nadeau to say that he wasn't opposed to making more of these at some point in time. He just had other stuff on his plate first. And so I'm very much hoping that that knife can come back because it was so substantially excellent that... Um, you know, a lot of people who've gotten them have just been like, oh my god, this is good, and frankly, it really, really was. And so I, I very much hope that that guy has a, a uh, return here one of these damn days, and that more people can get their hands on it, because, oh boy, was it good. 2019 was actually the start of a, uh, a slow descent into fixed blade reviewing. Now, fixed blades for me are always a little bit difficult because, A, they're not legal for me to, you know, daily carry around here, and especially ones that are nice and big and la or, uh, large big and large, both at once, right? Um, but at another level, I, I realize that, you know, spending some time with them, it's like I can still get a lot of good feelings about them, right? Um, and I can still try a bunch of testing at home, and frankly, I can still appreciate elements of them. And the Spydeco Waterway was one of the ones that kind of came to mind, uh, and was one of the ones that got me going down that route. A lot of the other small fixed blades I'd done had been like small EDC fixed blades, and those never made any sense to me, but the bigger guys I can totally get, and I can totally use in a variety of contexts. So so, you know, I think some would probably argue that I'm not the right person to be doing fixed blade reviews, and to an extent you're probably right, but I, I do actually feel a little bit better about doing them on the channel now, and although it's not going to be something I do a ton of, and I'm definitely going to be choosy, um, I think the Pison opened the, fl uh, not the Pison, sorry, I think the, um, the waterway opened the floodgates a little bit, eh, eh, uh, to that happening a little bit more in the future. 
The Seiko Alpinist is a watch that is, this particular release was a limited edition, ugh. but more importantly, it was a very, very nice watch. I mean, in a lot of ways, the Alpinist had a bunch of stuff going for it. It's a nice design. It, 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 there was a lot to love about it. And looking at this picture again, I'm thinking to myself, oh, that was a nice little watch. However, the, the important thing, and this is sort of one of the weird things about being a gear reviewer, right, is there's stuff that sticks with you and there's stuff that disappears. And I hadn't thought about the Alpinist for, uh, you know, eight months months or whatever more than that probably since I sold it it just hadn't even crossed my mind and so that's probably as good a sign of anything that you know yeah th there are lots of things that are really good pieces but ultimately I don't super care about and that's kind of interesting right and so that th that ended up not passing that test of like really good but not necessarily remarkable enough but then you get situations like the TRM Atom. Now, again, I've said about a bazillion things about the Atom before. It's clear that I like this. And in fact, right now I own two of this knife. I, I, I just went ahead and I bought a second one because I like a bunch of their scale options here. And I'm probably going to own three once they do the titanium version. But this is a knife that in some ways, design-wise, is unremarkable, but is a, a good enough tool that I don't care. It's really, really, really good. Um, it's a good slicer, etc. And it's a knife that keeps jumping back out at me. Like, oh, wow, this is good. And so there's this weird tension, right, of like there are things that are completely forgettable, like the Wee Deacon, the Alpinist, the, 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 the Ferrum Forge Dow. There are things that are very complicated but a little bit forgettable. Um, and then there are just these weird things. I don't even know what makes something jump out at me anymore. At some level, you know, as a reviewer, I'm a weird human, right? I'm a weird human, generally speaking. But uh, as a reviewer, you become a strange person. But what stands out, what jumps out, what catches my eye, I think maybe a a little different than for your average random jackass off the street. And I occasionally get comments that make me suspect that this is true, right? You know, I'll see like the uh, CKF 520 or 523 actually is coming down the pipe here. But these are knives that I think jumped out at me for design purposes more than they jumped out at me for anything else. And I think there's there's a validity there, but it's also something that makes it harder to understand. And so there's this level of, like, metacognition that goes into doing gear review of, like, okay, how much of this is me being weird because I look at too much damn gear, and how much of this is actually something that's real to the rest of the population, right? The Steel Wheel Tasso here is a, a knife with an ant lock. This is, as far as I'm aware, the only knife that's had this guy. Um, and it was it is a good lock. Um, fundamentally, it's a new lock, and it's a good lock, and that's kind of unusual. Um, the weird thing is that we haven't seen much else of this out of Steel Wheel. I'd love to see more ant lock knives out there in the world uh, than what they put out already, but for some reason, even their brand new stuff is just like... <sighs> Yeah, I don't get it. It's It was just bizarre. And so the, um, the, the the Tasso here was very good, but feels like it was sort of an island in the midst of a bunch of random liner and frame locks that everyone's going to forget about next weekend. I don't know. Weird, but it's just kind of the, the way it is, I guess. You know, these knives, the Summit Knife Half Dome, uh, there's a full titanium version and a, uh, a, a micarta version, are actually, I think, pretty good evidence in favor of, you know, occasionally people will call me, you know, oh, you're just a price snob, anything more expensive wins for you. And you know what, uh, A, screw you, and B, no, that's not true. And I think these knives demonstrate that, because I initially had the titanium one, and I was actually kind of unimpressed. It was okay, but it wasn't good. It, it was just like, eh, it was, eh. but then... I got my hands on the canvas one, which is much less expensive, and it was remarkably better. It was just a simply better knife. And that's the weird thing about these kinds of choices. Is some, And, you know, there were enough differences. A better clip, and just better scales, better lightness. It, it, it's the case that even though the titanium one is fancier by every, you know, estimation, that the canvas one was just better. And so certainly, I'm, I, I do have a bias. I like higher end. I like nicer stuff. And I'm not willing to put up with a lot of fit and finish issues. But these kinds of things, where, where the high end choice is not the right choice for me, make me feel a little bit like, no, there is some, you know, sense of reality that goes on here. Again, I've talked about, this is the HEA Design Flame. Um, I've talked about the fact, or even in this video, that there were knives that I wish I could own 
without having any reason to own them. I wish that I had infinite space and infinite money just to hold on to pocket knives. Um, because I think th there were so many really cool collections there. If I were a collector, if I, and I am a collector, but if I were a, you know, hoarder, let's put it that way, um, and I could just, you know, oh, randomly, you know, yes, take this. If I were a knife dragon just sitting on top of my freaking spoils in the cave there, I, I would love to have one of these guys in the collection because it was substantially cool. And it was substantially interesting. It was an art piece. I don't think I would ever carry it. Frankly, it, it, it's a weird piece, but it was also really interesting. Um, and so I just, this was a hard one to review, right? It was cool. And at some level, yeah, I don't even know. But it, it's a knife that I want to own, but it hasn't bothered me in any way, shape, or form that I haven't owned it for the last, what, I guess it'd be six to eight months or something like that. That's kind of interesting. The Herman Knives Sting, along with its bigger brother, the Dragonfly, put a new maker on my map, so to speak. Um, Herman Knives is not somebody I'd heard of prior to the, the, these reviews, but afterwards, I'm definitely keeping an eye on it. Because it's really good stuff. It's really well cnc They're absolutely not designed for disassembly in any way, shape, or form, but they're just so damn nice. Um, at the end of the day, the machining is great. There's a lot to love about these guys. And so I find myself sort of in this state where it's just like, yeah, I'm keeping an eye on the guy, but it it's so low production, it's so low... Yeah, but they're so damn good. They were a very pleasant surprise out of left field. I'd never seen them at shows or anything like that, but just just absolutely excellent. And uh, a big, big fan of the work there, even if there ain't that much of it happening. Spyderco Para 3 Lightweight. This was one of the more anticipated knives of the year, and I think one of the more interesting ones that Spyderco did, not because it's in any way interesting. It's kind of a weird thing to say, right? But I think it was very predictable. It was the spyderco Spyderco of all times. It was the Delica 4, it was the, or I'm sorry, Delica 5. It was, you know, a, a clear evolution of the PM, or uh, Para 3. I mean, it, this knife needed to happen, but once it did, it was really good. And although I know not everybody loved it, you know, my buddy Tony over at Everyday Commentary didn't care for it really at all, um, but I got it. I think it was really, really nice, and I still own one. I made a Maximed version of one for myself. And so, although I'm not necessarily sure that it's, like, it's not world-changing in any way, but it's really, really good to see, and I did appreciate it coming out, and I think it is a really big, frankly, it's probably Spyderco's most interesting accomplishment for the year, and that's kind of a weird thing to say, but it absolutely was. There are classes of knives that are very, very... Uh, they're interesting mostly in what they portend. And the, the CKF-523 was like that. This was a knife that was just too damn big. It was really good, but it was just too damn big. And so I kept going through that review thinking, oh my god, we need to have the CKF-520, uh, which brings it down to a reasonable size. We ended up getting that in early 2020, and thank god for that. But at the same time, um, the 23 was interesting mostly because of what it showed off. Coincidentally, here's the Gerber Fastball, which is in some ways the same damn thing. This is a knife that had some problems. They're still working on quality control and whatnot for these guys, but it shows a lot of progress very, very quickly. And so this portends very interesting things for Gerber, and it's put Gerber back on my map as a company that's like, okay, I should keep an eye on these folks. They're not out of the woods yet, but absolutely 100%. What the Fastball showed me is that Gerber is worth keeping an eye on again. And that was something that I wasn't even thinking about doing for a good long time there. And so is the fastball, you know, like, oh my god, the best knife ever? No, absolutely not. But you know what? It's pretty damn good for what it is, and it's a really decent, well, I'm sorry, it's pretty damn good for what it's coming out of, and it's a very, very good sign, I think, for the future of the company. One of my very favorite things to happen in 2019 was CRKT's moving up into the higher end. We're first with the shock we're seeing here, which is a knife that is completely and totally freaking ridiculous. It's it's uh, it's well made, but it, the price was completely out of control. It was an absolutely crazy knife, but it was, I think, something that they needed to do. They needed to really just try something crazy, just to shock the world. And I, again, I think uh, their nomenclature was not far off there. But they were just testing the waters on that higher end. In some ways, the Cricket Provoke was sort of a, 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 a bellwether for that, as I mentioned earlier. But I think the shock did serve its purpose. Um, not necessarily as a Halo product, but just as a, like, guys, we're doing crazy things, okay, take a look. And we actually saw this followed up shortly after. The uh, titanium home front is absolutely great. This is what happens when CRKT goes high-end and makes their great designs into something that is, well... 
<laughs> worth a damn, right? Um, using titanium, using all of this stuff, that is such a good knife. It is a knife that is very, very happily in my permanent collection. It is just damn good. And I, I, I... I can't wait to see more of this from Cricket. They have so many excellent designs from their past and from their present that just need to be brought back to life with a decent factory, and I really hope they're able to pull it off, because that will make CRKT a much more exciting company than they, frankly, have been for many years. And in fact, we see some signs of this, even with the CRKT, uh, C, blah, the CRKT CEO actually did some very similar things, where immediately they had some, I don't know if they're sprints or exclusives or what the heck they were, but some really cool stuff um, where they did this in a micata with some bronze liners and uh, nice esteem. I, 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 I can't wait to see CRKT experimenting with more of the price range. Like I said, they've got such good designs like the CEO, uh, and but they've been chronically underserving them for so long that I think the knife community has gotten a little disappointed, but hopefully they're going to claw their way back right up there. Oh, Casio. Casio this year just rocked my world twice. First with this watch, the Oceanus T2, uh, T200. Um, I ended up selling this guy to my buddy Tony over at Everyday Commentary because I knew he would be uniquely weak to it, and it is an amazing piece. But that piece, actually, I, uh, that, that, that was great in so many ways. Just watch my review. It's an amazing freaking watch. But that put me down the path of, huh, Casio does these really great high-end watches. I wonder what their truly high-end stuff would look like. And that brought this guy into my life. The Casio Oceanus S5000C. Really, really, really good watch. This was a thing that I thought was going to be a really bad idea, right? I figured that this would be the dumbest thing I did all year. Spending 1800 bucks on a Casio, what kind of idiot would do that? But it turned out to actually be one of the better watches I've handled, frankly. Um, and it, way better than anything I've seen out of Switzerland in quartz. I am really impressed with it, and it kicked the aerospace out of my collection. It is a, a watch that is just like, oh my god, how is this thing this good? Um, I, Casio has absolutely won my respect, and I am definitely a fanboy of theirs, given that situation. Oh, man, was that thing good. And so that was one of the things that brings me a lot of joy as a gear reviewer, right, is the ability to try a completely insane thing as an experiment for the channel. And lo and behold, it was a great experiment. Ended up changing my, uh, my watch box forever. Ah, oh, the workshop. I'm still taking heat for this one. So, I did my review, and I, I used the belt grinding attachment, and people were up in arms, because the way that I was using the attachment uh, is different than the way that they generally uh, claim that you should be doing it. Um, and so I was teaching people wrong! Oh my god, you don't even know how to use it! How can you review the damn thing? Um, and certainly, I mean, for, for some people, uh, yeah, you might get different results taking a different approach, but the thing is, for me at least, it was working, it just, uh, all of the issues were still there, right? And so this is a case in which it's sort of like you don't know exactly how to when you adapt to using a tool right you adapt it into your own life and so a lot of people were just not okay with my using it against you know it's not even the way you're supposed to yeah, yeah i know how you can use it it just you it, no i like the way i'm doing it better and so i took a lot of heat for that and i <laughs> I, maybe I should have said, oh, well, the way that the manufacturer recommends that you use it is this. But I, I don't freaking know. Um, either way, that one's been a... Uh, d d d still getting comments on that one on a regular basis and don't know that I need to. <laughs> I love seeing innovation. I love seeing new locks. I love seeing new approaches. I love seeing things that are just different than we've seen before in the knife world. Um, the Spydeco Parada then had a, a little bit of a soft spot in my heart for it, you know, with a, a little bit of extra work. The Parada was a very interesting knife. Um, however, it was also kind of a pain in the neck, and unfortunately it was done at the Japan factory with Black J10, and so as a result we ended up with a very low value. I feel like it's uh, th that locking mechanism has a place to shine, and I hope we see more of it in, in Spydeco's future, ideally done at a factory that gives a little bit more of a damn, or at the very least gives a little bit more value. But at the same time, I'm, I, I, I don't know, it's really tough. Like, I've never looked at that knife and thought, oh, wow, I should carry that, or oh, wow, well, I, I don't own it anymore, so, but I've never thought about, you know, oh, maybe I should pick one up. It's sort of that weird thing where it's like, I like the innovation, but I don't necessarily need what they were putting down there. I don't know. It's kind of strange, right? So much of this is.
Yet there are also these releases that go completely under the radar, and the Spyderco Native Chief was, I think, one of them. I did a review. It was a great knife. It is a great knife. The Native's a good knife. This is a great knife, too. And this gives you an option for a nice big blade. I, there is so much to love about the Native Chief if you love nice big blades, but because it's something that is sort of, well, just a big-ass Native, um, I think for a lot of folks, you're looking at something that's maybe a little less interesting to them. It's not like, oh my god, blowing you away. And so this was another really excellent release that Spyderco dropped that I think a lot of people didn't even really see. They didn't hear much about because there wasn't that much excitement for it. But it is a really solid, good tool and frankly deserves a lot more spotlight than it ended up getting. You can rewatch my review with this uh, 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 Chris Reeves Small Sabenza if you'd like to get a, a better sense of it. But in a lot of ways, 2019 was the year I made peace with the Sabenza. It's a weird thing to say at some level because, guys, come on, it's a freaking pocket knife. There's no peace to be made here. But at another level, um, it's a touchstone within the industry, right? And as a reviewer, there's kind of a there are certain points that you need to have, or certain pieces that you need to have around. I don't know whether I would still have a Sebenz if I weren't a, a gear reviewer. I don't know whether it would have been passed over for something else or whatnot. But it is very, very clear to me that I should have one around just as a point of reference, if nothing else, for the channel. But it's also a damn good knife. At some level, I, I. I Every time I carry it, it's just like, yeah, that's good, that's solid. And so I keep going back and forth on it. Even still, I've made my piece, but there's still elements of me that are just like, uh, what the heck? I don't freaking know. But at the very least, the Sebenza 21 is finally a part of my collection, and be partly because I am a gear reviewer, I don't necessarily see it going anywhere anytime soon. I talk a lot about iteration leading to improvement, and I think one of the biggest demonstrators of that ever is the uh, tactile turn uh, bolt-action pens. The slider and glider, their original bolt-action style pens, were complete and utter trash. They were just bad. Bad, 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 freaking bad. Um, and then they turned around and they knocked it out of the park with the bolt actions. They learned the lessons they needed to and they created something that is good, 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 freaking good. And I really, really loved seeing that. It was super heartening and it made me feel like, okay, there is justice in the world. That's a weird way to put it. No, there isn't justice in the world. But by God, for a second there, I had that pretty illusion and it was kind of nice, right? So that one was pretty damn nice. So the beats. Oh, the beats. When I picked these guys up, it was partly because I got a really good deal on them, and it was partly just, you know, for the channel to review things. But in practice, these guys have ended up having a much bigger impact in my life than I expected. They're, they're something I use on a actually a very regular basis, but not for what you'd think. I mean, if I'm doing serious listening, I use actual headphones with an actual headphone amplifier. What these are great for, though, is if I'm just wandering around the house wanting to listen to an audiobook or something like that, uh, but with the noise canceling on, or more importantly, um, if I am on a very long phone call or I'm in, you know, Discord voice chat with my patrons or something like that, those have turned into being sort of my go-to for that. And so they are a piece of gear that is ultimately, it's not the best, it's got some downsides, but they're really, really, really important in my life at this point in time. Sure, it could be that there's another unit that would give me just as, you know, excellent uh, uh, an experience, but I, they have turned into a surprisingly, um, I don't know, they, they, they've impressed the heck out of me, or at the very least, they've insinuated their way into my life well. And so I'm actually very glad I picked them up, and although initially I was thinking of selling them, at this point in time, I'd have to replace them with something else, because I found out that a really good set of Bluetooth headphones really is a big win for me. It's really tough as a gear reviewer to think about steel. Um, partly because, well, A, I'm not a metallurgist and whatnot, but B, because it's really, it, it can be so many things to so many people. The Gerber flat iron is a good example of a knife where the steel actually makes a major difference, right? Um, it is actually a very nice knife design, and in a lot of ways a very nice knife, but the steel they made it from is kind of trash. Um, they, they just didn't do a good job there, or more specifically, they cheaped the heck out. Um, and so I'm always really torn uh, as to whether to be a one-issue voter so to speak. You know, if I got something on my table that is, is substantially, the Cricket Cat Onion Slack is another good example of this, where it's like great knife trash steel. Um, it's really tough for me to figure out exactly where to weight that, right? Like a really great design can be 
fine with bad steel, but it would be way better with steel worth a damn. I don't know, it's tough for me to say. And so ultimately, the, the flat iron made me confront my steel snobbery right on, and it really made it difficult. I really wish they had done a better job of making it, and they'd used some materials that were worth more of a damn, because it was just so damn good. But that's something I constantly struggle with, is like, how good is this allowed to be, given the level of give a damn they had? It takes a lot to stick around in my collection these days, and especially when you're in my preferred range, right? So the Civivi McKenna here in Damasteel, or not Damasteel, I'm sorry, in a Damascus pattern welded steel, um, the Civivi McKenna turned out to be a very, I mean, it's right up my alley, right? It's a small front flipper that's compact, thin blade slicey, it's right up there. But the thing is, I have a bunch of knives like that these days. And so, although the, the, the McKenna is absolutely great, I find myself, you know, I, I found myself, that is, looking at it along with the other things in my box and thinking every time I might reach for this, I reach for something else instead, and so it didn't end up sticking around. So this is another one of those cases of an absolutely great piece that I just don't own because I have a lot of absolutely great pieces, and that's not quite enough to stick around these days. The Urban Survival Gear TIE Scribe Bolt Mini actually hasn't gotten as much playtime as you would think. Playtime, God, that sounds really weird, right? I uh, want to play a game over here. But anyways, th th it hasn't gotten as much pocket time is probably what I should have said there as you might think it would. Um, and that's actually kind of accidental, right? Um, th as it often is the case as a gear reviewer, there is a constant flow of new stuff that come in your way. And so in a lot of ways, you feel a little bit obligated to look at the new stuff rather than the old stuff. You, you, you constantly... Constantly. And so the, the, this, uh, the, the, the TIE Scribe Bolt Mini kind of came in, and then a bunch of other pens came in not long after it, and so I never ended up spending that much time with it in the pocket. Um, and doing this video and a, one the other day, um, the, 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 the Refine pen, um, has made me think, oh... I really need to give that more pocket time, because it was substantially good, right? And so there's, again, there's this weird tension of, like, I own this, it's incredible, but I just never carry it, that is a little different, I think, as a gear reviewer rather than as a gear collector. The Stan Wilson Non-Flipper Flipper. Absolutely an amazing piece, and I'm so thrilled I got a chance to finally handle one. Um, I don't tend to have grail knives, but this was a grail knife for me. Um, and I'm really grateful to my buddy Stanley, who loaned it my way for a little while. The problem comes that... It was just too expensive for me. Look, I, I have a lot of expensive gear. I'm a very lucky man, and having been able to, uh, you know, afford to pick some of these things up, in large part with help from my patrons, as well as just, uh, I'm a very lucky man. But this went over my limit, so to speak. You know, there was a level at which I was sad to see this go when I sent it home, but there was an even greater level where it was just like, okay, thank God, $8,000 knife is home safe with its owner. Like, at any given moment, it was just like, I'm looking at it on my table and thinking that should be in the safe right now. And so that kind of reminded me that there is a point, even for me, where it's just like, I can't go that high. I, I, I can't I have a limit. And I am sure that, you know, reassures some of the people who are constantly calling me a bourgeois bastard in the comment threads and whatnot. Um, it's a great knife, a absolutely. And if somebody handed me one, you know, if Stan Wilson made me one for free, LOL, um, I, I would accept it with incredible joy. It would be a big part of my collection, but the amount of money there is just, that smells like too big a chunk of a down payment for me. Um, I, I'm a very lucky man, but I ain't wealthy enough to do that, even though I kind of wish I were. And so, the non Flip a flipper is a knife that was great to have some time with, but ultimately it, it's not a knife that I'm, you know, saving up for, so to speak. It revealed the truth about me, and that was kind of nice, right? One other truth about me is that I'm an idiot. And this, this razor right here actually made that uh, very apparent. Uh, this is the Feather ASD2 razor. Absolutely amazing razor. Very, very good. In fact, the best razor I ever handled. So I got one. I reviewed it, and I thought to myself, this is great. But the thing is, I have the Razor Rock Game Changer, which is, you know, 85, 90% as good as this guy is for, for much lower. So you know what? I'll be a smart one. I'll sell the, ra I'll sell the Feather Razor, and I'll keep the Razor Rock, right? It's, uh, I'm making money over here. Then I realized that the Razor Rock was 85% as good, and I kind of missed that other 15%. 
And so I sold the, the feather, actually losing some money, as, as is the case with, uh, well, anytime I sell things on Patreon, I try and give my patrons a good deal because they're making me, uh, they're, they're being generous to me, so I try to be generous to them. So I, I lost a little money buying it the first time and selling it, and then I bought it again, and I feel so dumb. But oh my God, is it a good razor, right? I, I, I have stopped buying, you know, higher-end razors. I've stopped looking just because that's as good as I think I ever need to get. And so that is absolutely absolutely a joy, and, um, it, uh, but I am absolutely an idiot. In a lot of ways, 2019 is also a, a year where I really started to come a little bit more to peace with my uh, desire for Rod. Um, what I mean by that is that there were a couple of knives that have found their way in the collection. The Pena maybe comes to mind, the uh, Protex Sprint, although that was from 2018. Um, it, it, there were a bunch of things that came into my collection that I'm keeping around in part because they're solid tools, but in larger part because they're beautiful objects. And to me, the Spydeco Respect is one of those. Um, for a lot of people, though, they don't feel that way, and I get that. That's fine. You're welcome to not find it uh, attractive or anything, but the thing is, um, to me at least, it's absolutely wonderful. And it's so it's a piece that ended up sticking around um, mostly for aesthetic reasons. You know, it, it's a big old freaking fixed plate, and so I got one of those around if I need it, but at some level, there's just some level at which I'm picking up what they're putting down here, and so it ended up sticking around, even though I don't have a functional use for it. There may come a time where I end up, you know, selling it down the road or something like that, but for the moment, it's, it's in there, and it's in there just on the basis of, wow, this thing looks cool. The Wii Knives Malice was a knife that is also very, very good, but I don't happen to own. Um, the, the main reason for that is it's a little bit big, heavy, and overbuilt. That's kind of the point of it, right? But at the same time, it was substantially nice, with a really nice action, a nice design. I, I feel like the Malice actually has a lot going for it. It didn't end up getting maybe as much press as I thought it might. Um, it's a really substantially nice piece, and, uh, I don't know. I, I, I keep thinking of my, every time I see a picture, it's like, oh, why did I, why did I sell that? But then I remember, oh, because I've got a bunch of other things that would work just as well. I mean, if it's malice or shaman, I think I'm going shaman, but still, um, absolutely, a, uh, th th there was a lot of love there, and I hope that's a knife that gets a lot of love more in the future. I finally reviewed the GORUCK GR1. <laughs> um, it's been a long time coming. I have used and carried this backpack forever, and I finally got around to freaking doing it. But in the process, though, I, it's interesting because the, the world changed out from under me as I spent my seven years or whatever with this backpack. I don't even know the, the time frame there, but a long freaking time with this backpack. Um, the, the world changed around it. They went from being made in the U.S. to being made in Vietnam. They went, the, the, the whole bunch of crazy stuff changed um, over at GORUCK, and the company continued to progress in its own special little way. Uh, and so as a result, the, the, the review ended up being a lot different than I think it would have been had I been reviewing the GORUCK in 20, you know, 12, 2014 or something like that. I wasn't reviewing then, so of course it'd be different, but still, this was kind of a weird example of uh, the, the fact that the, the unit itself hasn't changed, but the nature of the, the, the unit in context is very different. And so that was sort of a weird thing to write. Like, how do I express my, you know, unbounded love for this pack? Well, at the same time, expressing my, frankly, discomfort for the way that things have been going at GORUCK. It's, it's very, very weird, and turned out to be a, a weirder review than I expected just because of that. One of those really big complicating factor things that ends up making reviews take freaking forever to write. That was probably a five-hour review just in the writing process, let alone in filming and all of that. So that was the situation right there. Oh, the Lumen Top FW3A. This is a light that is dumb. Um, I know that it is the darling of the flashlight community, but it is freaking dumb, and I am completely and totally uh, unashamed to say so. Mostly because the interface is just bad. It, they, they say it's complicated, they say it's configurable, they say it's all... No, it's dumb. At the end of the day, I f wound up feeling like, you know, uh, uh, no, go away, fl flashlight, you, you, you're awful. Um, but that's kind of a silly thing to say, right? Because at some level it is a, a darling of the... This is a case where I am reminded that I am not a flashlight person. At the end of the day, I look at a flashlight as a tool rather than an object of, you know, its own significance, so to speak. Uh, and so as a result, I wasn't able to nerd out enough on that to enjoy it. And ultimately, I ended up, my heart ended up getting pulled elsewhere. 
And that elsewhere is the, uh, <laughs> Eeg uh, not EGTAC, uh, this is the JetBeam RRT01 version 2. Um, this is a light that is, in some ways, if the uh, FW3A or FW2A is too smart, is too overdone in the interface, this one is completely minimalist. It's just a ring that you turn and the light gets brighter. And as a result, it is the very, very best light of the year. Um, it is so damn good at lighting things up that uh, with such a good interface, with just every damn part of it, all it needs is USB for it to be the perfect and last flashlight I ever need for my life. Really, really, really good piece, and it was such a contrast off of that freaking lumen top mess, or it's just like, you know what, hey, you turn the ring and it comes on. But this is one of those things that reminds me, you know, I um, we filmed an ep or we recorded an episode of Gear Geeks Live with uh, Zero Air, uh, who is a... Um, well-known flashlight reviewer. He does amazing work. But listening to Tony and him talking about flashlights, it was just like, wow, I'm not a flashlight guy. And in fact, this is one of the things I've realized for 2020 is that nobody really gives a damn about flashlight reviews. I might still grab a flashlight or two that really jump out at me, that are like, oh, wow. But there were pieces where it was just like, I really deeply and truly do not give a crap about this light, and so why am I bothering? And this is the perfect example. This is the Olight Baton... I think, Baton Pro, something along those lines. This is a light that in some ways broke me for flashlight reviewing. Um, not because it was bad. No, in fact, it's an absolutely fine light, but it's so damn boring. It did nothing super interestingly. It did nothing. It was just like, hey, we took another light and we spec bumped it. I should have known that when I went into, you know, they reached out to me and I should have really pressed them. Like, hey, what's better? Why, why do I give a crap? But I just said, oh, okay, it's probably better. They probably made some improvements. And they did, but they had tiny little improvements. And as a result, writing the review actually turned out to be difficult because it's just because it was like, oh my god, this is so uninteresting. They have done nothing of any note here. This is the flashlight equivalent of another titanium flipper frame lock. Like, wow, a Chinese made light with a slight lumen bump and, uh, you know, a circular tube. Great, amazing. Wow, what a shock. And so as a result, you know, like I said, this 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 hammered home for me that I really don't want to be doing random flashlight reviews. And you know, every so often I'll get an email from somebody saying, "Hey, have you heard, you know, oh, I've got the 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 the, the LumaJet 3000 TX8R-304. It's an amazing. It puts out 1600 lumens and it uses an 18650 battery." And it's just like I, it's another damn black flash, you know, it's another tactical flashlight, no one gives a crap. That, that's not true, because there were people who give a crap. There were people who nerd out hard on flashlights, but I just needed to remind myself that I am not among them. And ultimately, that's that that, that turned out to be a major factor for me, and it, it was a piece of growing that I did during the course of 2019. But the thing is, sometimes boring is actually good. And this is an example of that. This is the Chaburkov's uh, Strish uh, model. Strish, I'm not sure which. Um, look, this was one of the better uh, knives I handled this year, despite being one of the simpler ones. It just had an amazing grind. Good ergonomic handle. There was just so much to like about the Strish series, large and small. I was very, very happy to get a hold of those. Um... They'd flown completely under my radar, but they shouldn't have, because they were just so damn good. And so the Strige models, uh, despite being very simple, despite being relatively straightforward, despite being the same thing we've sell seen a thousand times before, ended up leaving a major impression on me and ended up spending some time in my collection. I ended up moving the small along, because every time I would reach for that, I could reach for the Sebenza or a couple of other options. But nonetheless, really, really good piece. Another knife that was boring but really good is the Doug Ritter uh, Hogue uh, RSK Mark One G2 or something along those lines. This little guy right here, this was a knife that is also very much in that category of kind of boring, but at the end of the day, super compelling. If I just need a random knife for something, this is pretty damn good of a choice. I'm definitely a fan of the, uh, of the Ritters in general, and this one really upped the game. And it's making me watch Hogue a lot more closely. Um, if they're doing the Axis style, I'll lock this well. Oh, that's going to be exciting. So I'm really excited to see what 2020 holds, and I think the uh, the, the this whole uh, the Ritter that is is a, a bellwether of what's got to come over there. Then there's the Spyderco Capara. Um, this is a case where they actually updated an existing model completely, like, out of the blue. Just like, yeah, it's a good model, but we went ahead and we put it on a pivot bushing just so that it was, you know, absolutely, you know, crazy, drop shutty, ridiculously good. That kind of flew out of nowhere, and they didn't even do any fanfare. They didn't call it, like, the Kapara 2 or anything like that. It was just like, yeah, it was a great model. We made it greater. 
Eh, no big deal. It was kind of a big pivot energy move, but in some ways I wish they'd made a bigger deal out of it, right? If they they, they could have done that is, you know, the, the, the brand new, you know, the Capara 2. And I think it would have made actually somewhat of a splash because it was a great model that ended up turning out even greater. But they just sort of did it softly, and that was a little weird to me, but hey, I guess rock on, Spider-Go, whatever. So remember that whole thing about me being an idiot? Yeah, I'm an idiot. Um, turns out that if you buy something at full retail price, and then you write a 20-30 minute video explaining exactly why it is so damned overpriced, and then you try and sell it to people who believe you as a reviewer, namely your Patreon patrons, it's really hard to get full retail price back out of it. In fact, I ended up taking a substantial bath on the Shirogorov Neon Zero because I think I made a very compelling argument that there's an extra 300 bucks hiding in there that nobody can find. Um, it's a great knife in a lot of ways, but at the same time, especially compared to that um, the, the, the freaking CKF uh, I was showing you earlier, I don't freaking see it. And so as a result, though, um, this was a, a review that I think was important for me to do in the way that I did. Um, but I really wish I'd just taken a loan, right? And the thing is, my buddy LeVon over at the Knife, Butts, uh, Knife Nuts podcast, that is, he offered to loan it to me like, no, I don't know, I might want to keep this one. This could be really good. No, I'm just a freaking idiot. And so as a result, I lost some money there. But the nice thing is I got Patreon patrons, right? Not only did they benefit from my loss, so to speak, but... Um, they make it possible for me to take baths so you all don't have to. Still, um, turns out that telling people something is overpriced is not a good solution to getting full price back out of it. Go figure. Oh, the GSD, Greg Stevens Designs uh, 4M. This was a great watch in many ways, but it's a watch that I sold. But it's a watch I ended up getting back. It's a weird case of if you love something, set it free. If it comes back, it was meant to be. Um, I got this watch after meeting the guy at USN. I liked it a lot, substantially. Then I realized, eh, I didn't quite like enough of it. There were a couple of elements that drove me a little crazy. The off-color the, or the off -color loom, the um, blued hands rather than silver, etc. And so it's a watch that I, I found to be substantially good, but it didn't quite get there for me, and so I ended up selling it, and that's fine. Um, the thing is, though, uh, about four months later, I did the American uh, Watch and Clockmakers Institute class and built a watch, and guess what? It's damn near the same watch, because Greg Stevens designed that one, too, except I could make it in the, with some fixes. I could make it in a way that it didn't have some of the things that bothered me, and so I ended up with effectively the same damn watch, just a little bit better for me and that was great um and so I, I you know i at some level maybe i would have preferred not to have taken the bath on the first one but at the same time it, it was very nice because having that experience let me know okay this is exactly what i want so that later on when i built my own i could well build it just like i actually want and that was actually a very nice thing the Dutch blade work Xerxes has gotten almost no love, and I don't get why. This is a knife that is really, really, really freaking good. Um, it's not like quite knife of the year material, although it could very easily have been in another year. I definitely had it in consideration. But it's just so well designed, it's so interesting. I think there are a couple of things they could have done maybe a little differently to get more high-end collectors interested. But I'm really shocked that I don't see this guy out and about more in collecting circles. I, It is so substantial substantially excellent, with great design, is great construction, and a lot of really interesting stuff going on that it just shocks me that more knife nerds aren't just all up on that guy like flies on um, uh, uh, evil characters in Dostoevsky's work. It, it's a symbol, trust me. Anyways, uh, so I, I am not a big, uh, or I'm sorry, I, I'm just completely shocked that that's not a bigger deal out there in the knife community right now. Whatever, but, you know, still, like, really? Did you guys, did you miss this one? This is good. The K&H Akita is a wa uh, wallet that I kind of knew from the start. And I've got to, I talk about this a little bit in my uh, Above All Else to Thine Own Self Be True video. Um, where I knew from the start that this snapped version might not necessarily do it for me. Um, but I loved this wallet in a lot of ways. I liked the leather it was made out of. I liked the coloration scheme. I liked a bunch of stuff about it. But it ended up being that, well, as I predicted, that particular form factor wasn't up my alley. That said, um, once I got that guy back, I actually contacted K&H and I had him make me 
a uh, Kali wallet, which is the one that I'd been kind of carrying previously, but uh, with that same leather, with that same threading, with that same color scheme, and this is the wallet that I'm carrying right now, and that I, I, I am just over the freaking moon with. I like my other one in Chrome Excel a lot, but this one... Uh, so I learned a lot from the Akita in, with regard to my own personal version, and so I, 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 and I was very happy to go, you know, that extra mile and uh, end up with something that I liked even more. Again, this is one of those cases of one of the big benefits of being a gear reviewer is that you can ch try out a bunch of things and you can figure out exactly what you fall in love with as a, a human and end up carrying the very best that you can find. Again, I'm a very lucky man in that way. So the CJRB Centros is a really, really excellent piece. Um, and I mean that in a couple of ways. I mean, design-wise, it's absolutely great. Um, and, and that's the biggest thing that it's got going for it, right? It's a reasonable construction, but a great, great design from a good designer. The problem with it, though, is that CJRB, which is the budget wing of Artisan Cutlery, ended up just dropping knife after knife after knife after knife after knife, a bunch of mediocre crap onto the market immediately following this, and they never actually really promoted the Centros. Like, they had a gigantic hit on their hands, but they just kept bleh, 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 more skews out into the freaking market, and this is something that I'm really tired of. You know, CRKT does this too, where they release a couple of great models, but then they flood the market with a bunch of other crap that's, you know, feels like, like, well, we need to release 58 knives this year, so I guess we gotta keep pace, right? And I just don't get it. I really desperately wish that they released a few good designs rather than 50,000 so-so ones, such that, you know, they could be seen as a company that's putting out great knives, rather than a company that's mostly putting out forgettable crap, but has a couple of gems in the middle there. It just, it, like, I really wish that people would calm down a little bit. As a reviewer, I always have trouble uh, dealing with new variants of an existing model that I've reviewed, and this Protec Magic California Legal Edition is sort of an example of that, right? Um, because at the end of the day, it's a Protec Magic, and I've reviewed the Protec Magic, so why am I re-reviewing this guy? But another level, it, off it offers something that is now available to California people that wasn't available previously, and so I can see there being a major benefit to going that route. Ultimately, I, I ended up making the call, yeah, I want to check this guy out, and I ended up doing sort of a quick review on it, just highlighting its existence, but it's always difficult for me to figure out when they when you change something you know relatively small to make something that I've already reviewed into something a little bit different, but not necessarily that different and not necessarily that much better, but useful to some. It's always hard to figure out exactly where to come down and you know where to do that and how to do that. So that's the decision I ended up making. But um, it's a very very nice little knife, and it's one that's definitely in my collection, even if I don't end up carrying it all that often. It's really cool. I like the magic design a lot. Speaking of knives that are really hard to get a sense of how to review, this guy right here, the Pena Front Flipper Trapper uh, production version. So I already talked about my Pena Custom that I absolutely love, and this is the production version of it. The problem that this knife had is that it was going to sell out instantly and that he wasn't making more for a long time. And so there was always the question of, like, do I do a full review which should take a little while and then wait to release it until more of them come up or do I do or do I just kind of do a quick review just kind of shoot from the hip because I only got one the day before they were releasing to everybody in the public right or do I do a quick review shooting from the hip giving my feelings and letting people buy them later on in fact this is something I struggle with regularly because very often there's a fair amount of downtime between when a video release uh, when something arrives on my desk and when I will film a video to release it and so as a result it, it's always tough to figure out exactly how to balance Balance that out, right? And so the Pena Front Flipper Trapper here, uh, I ended up doing the, the four. I ended up just basically doing a disassembly, which a lot of people like to see before they do a, a purchase, and uh, just giving my basic thoughts. And then, you know, they sold out in like 10 minutes the next day anyways, which sucks, by the way. Um, But, you know, it, 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 that's kind of where I ended up landing. But it's really hard as a gear reviewer. If you suspect something's going to disappear in a heartbeat, you know, do you even do the review? What What's the story there? But I, I, I don't know. I, it's hard to tell way to come down on that one, but that's where I came down on it. Yeah, go figure. I actually had a similar problem with the Monterey Bay EWC, um, which is that, uh, in this case, by the time I was ready to fully review it, it had already sold out. I knew, though, that there was another batch coming, and so what I elected to do, actually, was to hold on to that review. I ended up taking that review, and I, I, I just sat on it for a little while. And because I knew they were going to make some changes in the, in the batch, I ended up uh, basically re refilming the review once I got a second generation one in my pocket, and that way I was able to drop the review when there was available of it. As a result, though, there were a couple of months in there where people 
had seen, they're like, oh my God, you know, you, you're talking so nice about it. Where's the review? But the thing is, if I posted the review while it was sold out, I'd get a bunch of people grumbling in the comments, oh my God, you bush swap bastard, you're reviewing nice and I can't even buy it. What are you talking about? And I'd get all that kind of BS. I know, Seagulls, it's really annoying, isn't it? When people comment like that. But anyway, so I'd get a bunch of people complaining that you couldn't actually buy it if I reviewed it then. But if I hold on to it, I get a bunch of people saying, oh, you come on, you, 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 you're supposed to release the review. It's been three months. Where's my review? Like, you, you can't win, right? I mean, that's the, the good summary of the YouTube comment section just generally is like, you can't win. I have great commenters, but <laughs> they tend to get drowned out a little bit. But anyway, so I ended up holding on to that review, knowing that it was going to be a very, very strong recommendation until there was a lot more availability. I um, managed to kill that availability overnight, but uh, nevertheless, it, 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 there was availability, and there will be more of it again. But I ended up making that decision when that time came, and it was, uh, it was a tricky one to make, but I think ultimately I ended up making the right call. Oh, the Holt Spectre. I still freaking love this knife. Um, it, it's absolutely beautiful. It does get pocket time. It's, it's just so damn good. I'm super impressed with this piece. The thing, though, is, like, this is a knife I've reviewed before, and this is a knife that at this point in time is so customized that I'm not sure I can review it, you know, fairly, so to speak. Luckily, my thoughts on the Spectre are not exactly ambiguous, and so I don't think anyone's going to have trouble figuring out how I feel about it. But it's always difficult as a reviewer when you do something that is a little bit more custom for you, A, because no one else can go ahead and get one. I was on the books for this a long freaking time ago. Um, and B, because it's going to be very customized to my own taste. A lot of people post in the comments like, oh my god, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Like, well, I, you're wrong, but okay, cool. Have, have fun being wrong. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's a little tricky to figure out exactly how to handle that on the review front um, when you pick something up that's very much personal for you as a human, right? It's the, 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 the weird tension in the reviewing world. The Tuya Envy is a knife that is really, really good. Um, and it's another one of those knives that I'm actually surprised hasn't gotten a lot more traction in the knife world. Um, th th there were a couple of design decisions that I think aren't going to resonate with everybody. That weird kind of tanto tip compound grindy thing I think isn't going to be for a lot of folks. But at the same time, it's good. It's really, really good. And it was a nice demonstration from a company that not a lot of people had heard all that much out of. And I think really made something pretty impressive as a result. I, I sort of suspect that there's, hopefully there's going to be more batches of these in the future, and that they'll eventually start trickling into the market in greater numbers. And maybe the other thing is that people are kind of bored of flipper, uh, flipper frame locks at this point in time, but that was a knife that was way better than I expected it to be, and I'm, I'm a little surprised I'm not seeing a lot more of out and about. It's always a joy to see a knife. This is the Giant Mouse Ace Sonoma. It's always a joy to see a knife that, in a lot of ways, I had sort of asked for. I, and I'm not saying that I was in contact with the Giant Mouse people at all. Um, but when I reviewed the GM3, there were a couple of major issues with it, and then they fixed them all in the Sonoma. They made it cheaper. They made it a non-limited edition. They did a really, really nice job making a, a knife that was just better than the GM3 at a lower price with the Sonoma. So in a lot of ways, I found myself during that review feeling like, wow, this is amazing. This is great. I love this feeling, right? Like when I, when I complain about a bunch of stuff and you fix all this stuff, it's like, hey, we're looking pretty good here. Um, but yeah, so that was actually a very nice review to see, not because I think that people should listen to everything I say and fix all the things I highlight, but because it's really nice to see it when it does happen because it just it feels like, hey, cool, the world's getting better, right? Um, that's kind of a weird way to put it, but yeah, definitely a thing. In a lot of ways, one of the very biggest things that um, came out of 2019 for me, or one of the biggest themes, that is, was oversaturation. And I've touched on this a bunch of times during the course of this video. You know, the Wee Deacon, the Ferrum Forge Dow, the, um, and then this guy, the Spyderco Sage 5. It felt like there were so many good knives that after a point it was just like, wow, these are all starting to run together. Excellence wasn't enough. It needed to be excellent and weird. It needed to be excellent and offer something compelling and new. It needed to really jump off the page in a way. And I feel like the Sage 5 uh, Lightweight here was a very, very, very good knife, but it didn't do that. It didn't clear its own orbit. You know, with the Sage 5, with the Pair of 3 Lightweight, with all these other things out there in the world, although it's a substantially good knife, and a lot of people have said, Nick, you got that wrong. It's amazing. I'm like, no, I'm not right. I, it is amazing. I agree with you, but it's also not 
that shocking anymore. It's not, it doesn't clear its own orbit. And so we're in this really weird place, I think, with a lot of pocket knives right now, where it's like, this is really good, but that's not enough. And I, I'm sure that must be super frustrating to makers, where it's just like, you know, they're creating stuff that is so much better than what we would have had in 2015, 2016. You know, God, if, if some of this stuff was available in 2010, it's just like mind-blowingly different. The world has changed. But at the same time, it's so very hard to get noticed right now. And I, I mean that in the greater community sense, not just by, you know, random jackasses on the internet or on YouTube, that is. So I think that in a lot of ways, one of the things I'm hoping to see more of in 2020 is makers jumping out of the box, so to speak, because that's how you're going to get noticed. If you do the same thing that you've been doing, and I would argue that in some ways the Sage 5 Lightweight is uh, very much a samey-samey knife. A lot of the flipper frame locks are samey-samey. Um, you're not going to get noticed. You can do something that is technically amazing and incredible, but it's not going to get you noticed. And this is the why question that I asked in a video, I think that was in 2019, um, maybe that was 2018, but it was just like, you need to ask that question or else you're going to have a hard time. You're going to be a casualty of this. You're going to be at the end of the 2020 video and be going like, wow, that was really good. I don't know why we don't talk about it more. And then I sit back and I think about it and I realize, oh, it's another damn titanium flipper frame lock. Of course, that's why we don't talk about it anymore. I don't know. Um, it, It's a little crazy and I, I, I don't envy anybody getting into the knife market right now, but it's a very, very tough time. And in a lot of ways, thinking about my reviewing in 2019, I think a lot of it was trying to manage that tension, right? Of trying to make sure that you're being fair to everything that comes across the table, but also keeping an eye on the context. And that context was better knives every damn day. You're just getting better and better and better and better and better and better and better until it was just like, oh my god, I it, 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 these are so freaking good. Um, and so I I guess that might be my biggest um maybe takeaway thinking about 2019 is that so it, it is so hard to be good right now because everybody's good and you need to be better. You need to be good and different. You need to be good and outstanding in some way. And it's just not good enough to be good at this point. I don't know. Um, good God, we're an hour and three minutes into this. This is a little crazy. Um, but look, I, I do need to, of course, talk about the very best knife that I reviewed in 2019 and we'll, we'll take it from there. That is, of course, the Nick Shabazz Victorinox. Um, this is a completely ridiculous object. Uh, not the, but partly because, oh my god, I have a Swiss Army knife branded after me. That's hilarious. But partly just because um, I, I never actually reviewed... Like, can I review this? Am I able to? Am I allowed? Is that legal? I don't freaking know. Um, but either way, um, this was a thing that happened in 2019 that amuses me just insanely. Um, this was one of the... Uh, Ben Peterson, uh, formerly of Blade HQ, now a freelancer, so to speak, um, was a, uh, he had been in touch with me about this, and it was just like, really? You you want me involved in this? <laughs> really? Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you need better people to do this but okay i'll jump in and it's actually been something that's brought me a lot of joy not necessarily because oh my god but it's just like i have a swiss army knife branded after me and this is the level of insanity that i could not have predicted when i started this channel a long time ago that not only are companies you know wanting to send me things for free which is ridiculous but um you know i'm actually i i have merch not only do i have the shabazar it's shabazar.com uh, but i have the the, the, the the, the, the freaking Swiss Army knives. I have, I have all of this stuff, and I, yeah, it's been. 2019 has been an escalation of the craziness that is my, my life as a reviewer. It's a wonderful craziness, though. And even as I sit here and I complain and I, I, I think and I meta-analyze meta all of this stuff, at the end of the day, it's absolutely been wonderful. And, you know, reviewing in 2019 has been great. I've, I've absolutely loved it. I'm not quitting my day job anytime soon. Frankly, I, I couldn't. It's not a possibility, given my life and my expenses, but um, it is absolutely 100% uh, amazing. And so I guess my review in 2019 was crazier than ever. But that's partly because my life as a reviewer in 2019 was crazier than ever. But for the most part, honestly, it's been a good kind of crazy. And that's really what I can get around. Or that's uh, really, I can. that's what I want in my life, right? Uh, the, the, the very best kinds of crazy. So anyways, there you go. I hope this has been interesting, that you've managed to stay awake for the full hour in six minutes, and that you have yourselves just an absolutely wonderful uh, rest of your day. And I'll uh, see you in 2021 for this uh, next year's video. Bye now.